Welcome to the STEM Innovation Panel for Connecticut. Um, this is a, one of our ongoing series of educational webinars where we get experts together from around the country and different states and talk about best practices. So um, we're very excited to have these folks here today. I'll introduce them in a minute. Um, just a quick note before um, we get started, if you have a question, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you have um, some other kind of support technical issue, then please chat and Lindsay will be happy to help you out. Um, but that is really important. So the Q&A button is how we're gonna answer all of our questions uh, from our moderate, from our um, participants, for our panelists. And uh, if I can answer a question, happy to do that as well. Um, also a note, your microphones will be muted throughout the webinar just to make sure we can hear all of our panelists really well. Um, and so let's, let's kick it off. So, Obviously, this has just been a crazy, unprecedented time in education. Um, I was just, if you heard me just talking to the, the panels about how it's, it's one of these things where I feel like we all need reassurance that what we're doing makes sense, what we're doing somewhat works, and then by the same token, getting best practices from other, from other people who feel are feeling success has never been more important. So I'm really excited and thankful to have all these, these uh, wonderful panelists with us. I'm gonna introduce them without any further ado. Um, okay, so let me start with pulling my list up. All right, let me start with Barb. So Barb Hafner is here. She's the Director of Teaching and Innovation for Meriden Public Schools. Uh, she works with staff and students to infuse the use of devices and digital content, uh, K-12, and she has led the district transformation to student-centered learning environments. So. Um, Prior to joining Meriden, uh, Barb was also providing educational technology professional learning um, to educators throughout the state of Connecticut. And then also uh, from Meriden, we have Sue, and Sue um, was an early adopter of instructional technology, and she is the supervisor of blended learning. Um, she, super, she serves as curriculum supervisor of science and career and tech um, ed departments for K-12 and supports the student-centered learning initiative device, uh, device one-to-one program. So in February 2020, Sue was also recognized as a Legends of Learning legendary leader, AKA the integrator. Very important to have your superhero name at ready to go. <laughs> yes, mine's the chancellor. So I mean, you know, you, you have to have these things. Karen, you're gonna have to come up with a superhero name, like maybe on the spot. Okay, and then we have Kate O'Donnell, who's from Wallingford, and she is the science and tech curriculum coordinator. Um, 27 years of Wallingford. So Kate is a Wallingford expert. Uh, and she is an integral part of that Wallington, Wallingford STEM Town Initiative um, and the development for the Center for Innovation and Design, where she does an aerospace experience to Mars. Sounds incredible. Uh, and finally, we have Karen Lohr here from New Haven. Last but not least, uh, Karen is an amazing instructional coach for math um, at the Roberto Clemente Leadership Academy, and she's been there since 2012. So she is a great advocate for urban students. Um, she advocates for different differentiated lessons and small group instruction um, and obviously knows how critical those are and that we just cannot let our students fail, except when it comes to taking safe kinds of risk. Um, so I want to kick it off um, with a question for the group. I want to really just, I'm going to open it up um, before we get into specific questions and ask you guys, what man, what is it like out there? You know, what is it like having gone from totally in-person school on March 14th I think I speak for all of us here, to going to March 16th and having basically the entire state get totally told everyone's going home and you know how to adjust to a new normal. So if we could start with uh, Barb and Sue from Meriden, could you guys tell us about, either one of you guys, what has that, just tell us, what has that been like for you guys? Sure, I'll jump in first and Sue can add. So um, it's been interesting to say the least, but there's been a lot of new learning for all of us um, here at Central Office, as well as with teachers and students and families in the district. Uh, we are running what seems like two school districts. We have an in-person uh, school district where we have students coming every day, K through eight, and our high schools are on a hybrid model. Um, and then we also have families that have selected distance learning and obviously those families are home every day learning online. So it's been a bit of a learning curve, um, but I, I'm happy to say that our teachers, students and families have really stepped up and adjusted to this new normal. Um, and we really try to be flexible, listen to feedback from everyone and make changes how uh, we think is appropriate to best meet the needs of everyone. 
Yeah, I agree. And I think that after being out in the spring, um, you know, after being out so abruptly and then being out through the end of the school year, our teachers and our students and our parents were really ready to get back to in-person learning. So we're, we're very lucky that we have a strong partnership with our health department and have been able to get systems in place to allow us to offer that as an option for our families. So, um, so far the cohort model is, is holding strong and uh, we are, we're happy to be in person, but also offering a distance learning option for the parents mm -hmm. who prefer that. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that's gotta be very challenging. We'll get more into this later, but very challenging to all of a sudden go to offering more than one model of education. Right. It's like running uh, two districts. <laughs> yes. That's a really good analogy, right? All of a sudden you work for Meriden V1 and Meriden yeah. V2. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Kate, what about you over in Wallingford? So our, our model is slightly different. Um, we have in-person learning K5 and then 612, we are a hybrid model um, where students come in in the morning and then the cohort B is online in the afternoon and we switch every two days. Um, in, in the spring, the turnaround was unbelievable. Yeah, it was so impressive the way that teachers and parents and students just owned it. I mean, we had very little time to completely flip a learning model. Like we, we weren't even one-to-one -one K-12, we, but you know, we, we made it happen um, district-wide. And, and it really, really goes to show you how important flexibility is. Um, and it was really impressive. And then we have the summer, to prepare for what we didn't know was coming. So yeah. it really was a gift of time to be able to then kind of backfill those skills that we saw were needed when we went out in the spring to be able to prepare for coming back in the fall. So it really was great for us to have the summer to figure out what the best model was gonna be, what resources do we need and start to develop some of those resources. And the experience for parents and students in the fall is so much better than it was in the spring. Mm -hmm. You know, as hard as everybody was working in the spring, I think we really are knocking it out of the park this fall. Well, that's fantastic to hear. I think that, yeah, we, I've heard that a lot in my own kids. I think my experience, experience has been that, you know, the kids, there, there is an actual structure now. There is an expectation, whereas before it was like, I don't know what Tuesday means. I don't know what the weekend means anymore. But now it's like that your school day is seven to three or nine to three, whether you're at home or you're in school. Is that kind of how you guys have set things up too, where virtual has that day, like that hour by hour structure for kids? Yes, yeah. in Meriden, I would say that's the model we're following. Okay. Yeah, we have different schedules, whether you're a VDL student or an in-person learning student, but there are very specific times when you move from one subject or one class to the next, whichever model you, you have chosen to be under. Okay, so there's a lot of choice. That's really excellent. I think that's, it's, it's, it's great to see that virtual learning is providing a model. I think from what I'm seeing, even more choice than before, um, which we know kids love and it's also really important to parents when there's gotta be so much flexibility with schedules and having kids learning independently. So Karen, tell us a little bit about New Haven. What's going on there? So currently we are still virtual um, and it's actually, really uh, interesting, I should say. Um, when we went out in the spring, um, one of the things that it was like everyone said, it was so abrupt. Like we were like, oh, we thought maybe two weeks and then it went further and further. And I think it was um, shocking for the teachers and for the students because, you know, being in New Haven, it's like, um, we try to make school like a home. So, you know, it's like a schedule. The kids, you know that your kids are coming to school. You know you're going to provide them breakfast. You provide them lunch. Now, when this, new, this happened, the pandemic happened, it's like now you started wondering about just the simplest things. Did our kids eat? You know, even though you can come to the school and pick up food, but like, are they okay? Are they, um, what's going on with them? Do they have uh, internet? How's their Wi-Fi connection? Just all these things that you just started wondering um, about that you don't really, I would have to say that we took for granted. 
because yeah. they were in our buildings. Um, and so I think overall, our district learned from that and we were able to make um, accommodations for this school year, just for the, actually just this first quarter. Um, we are to, um, we're now preparing to go hybrid. Um, we're to start um, around November 9th. Um, we might, uh, that's the plan. And we've now started to do a mind shift into what that's going to look like. Cause you know, we're, we got acclimated to now we are on, we use the learning platform, um, Google Classroom. So now we, we were able to see our students through Google Meet and it was like so exciting. It's like, hi, hi. And, um, and yeah. now we're going to add another piece to that where now we're going to be seeing them face to face, but still at a distance. And then we're now going to have to also teach to those students who choose not to return back to the building. So it's, it's, it's true. Like what you got ladies just said about the flexibility. It's, it's about, um, I mean, you're being flexible daily on, at, at every given moment and you just have to go with the punches because anything is possible. Just like right now we're having this conversation and in one split second, someone can have an internet connection issue. And so you just go with the flow. It's just, that's one of the things I should definitely say that adapting, it's, you're, it's a true go with the flow type of situation. Yeah, and I like what you said, Karen, about um, kids and just meeting their basic needs. And I think that obviously varies a lot, but when you're talking about urban districts, and I'm sure we've got um, other teachers on this call and administrators with those needs, um, Title I schools, kids that have challenges with meeting basic things like, that was such a big deal. So I'm from Baltimore City, and that was the first thing that came up was kids not getting to meet those needs. So you feel like that they've got that more stabilized now, and that kids can focus more on the learning. Kind of got gotten beyond that. Um, well, where we were, where, what we did for, which I think was great, we opened up when we opened up the schools for the kids to come and get food. Um, we did it initially, trying to do it on a daily, but we saw that that was a lot. So then we switched it to like um like a every other day and then they would pick up two to three days worth of food. Yeah. And it seems to have worked. But now we see the parents they're coming, um, they're picking up the food for their kids. And they like it's not just like for my school, it's not just the teach not just the students that attend my school, it's mm -hmm. the students who attend a New Haven school. Gotcha. So it's wherever you live that the school is closest to you that you can get food. And I think that that is just amazing. One of the other things that I think is great that New Haven has done, we, we, we're we supplying hotspots for our parents who don't have um, inconsistent um, Wi-Fi connection. And so that to me is huge because us, all of us ladies living in Connecticut, we've had the bad weather and internet went. And it was like, ah, what are you supposed to do? And then you just realize how just the simplest thing can just like change up what you plan for the day. And now everything now had to now turn to be asynchronous instead of it being synchronously done. So it's again about adapting and flexibility. Yeah, I want to get back. I want to get back to that, for that question back to the group here in a second. Um, so like you know, in, ter in terms of, but I, I got so excited, I forgot to even introduce myself. So, <laughs> so, you know, Legends of Learning, you know, we also had to do this pivot, you know, and if you guys, if you haven't uh, experienced Legends of Learning at all, we are a totally online science and math platform, and we do work with Wallingford and uh, with Meredith and now with New Haven. And we also had to think about the stuff that they're talking about, right, with well, everyone has mentioned so far, which is like, how do we all of a sudden accommodate people's schedules in a virtual environment? How do we make virtual feel like in person? How do you have that that like seamless experience of whether you're working from home or you're working in school? Um, and how do you not have teachers feel like they have to write two different lesson plans? Like how how does that happen? Because like Susan's joking and Barb's joking like V one V two with Meriden, but like that probably is really how it feels, mm -hmm. right? Like and we know a lot of teachers are stressed out. So I want to get to that as the next topic of what have you guys seen as the biggest challenge for teachers? Um, you know, so far, you know, what are you hearing from your teachers as like, my God, like this is the most challenging part of teaching 
in the STEM environment right now? How do how are they fa- what challenges are they facing with STEM, you know, right now? Let's let's start out with Susan and Barb. So Go ahead, Susan, I, you can start. Okay. So I think um, you know, there's a couple of things that have been challenging for for teachers, especially in STEM areas. One, you know, it's a very hands-on area. Right, and so they really had to rethink some of their instruction because we can't share materials that we used to share. Um, and how do you do that in a virtual environment? So there's ha- there has had to be um, a shift in how they're introducing things. Um, and I think the other thing that that our teachers have found really challenging is um, remembering that element of self care and letting go of the things that they can't control. So. Um, you know, they, teachers want to be there for their students, you you know, they want to make sure that they're fed and that they're clothed and that they're doing well. And, um, you know, we've really tried to work with our teachers to remind them. Yeah, I've heard several times in the last couple of weeks, you have to put your own oxygen mask on first. Um, And that's a, that's a difficult concept for teachers to, to Mm -hmm. embrace. Mm Mm-hmm. And I'll add, I think our teachers really miss working alongside their students. So when you're working physically next to a student, you could do a lot of cueing. You can give um, some reminders. You could do a simple point to something on a page. Um, So that's been very different for our teachers in person, but then take it to the next level for our teachers who are teaching completely in the distance learning environment they have class sizes of 25 to 30 students mm-hmm. all in one room and engaging students so that all students are participating and engaged in an activity has been a new challenge that they've had to face so that it's just it's very different and they're beginning to share new techniques that they have found that are very successful and then there's always those techniques that you say don't try this it, it didn't work for me so I, I think that's a perfect next point here, and I'll, I'll stay with you guys for a second. So what, what solutions have you seen teachers come up with and to do STEM in this environment? You know, at first they had this challenge and, you know, but how, what, what, have they, what, what have you seen that's been innovative that they've done that's really made a difference for kids? I would so say, I, from my perspective, I see a lot with um, document sharing. We're a Google uh, Sweet district or now Google Workspace district. So um, a lot of collaboration around document sharing, a lot of collaboration around working on um, Google Slides as a group, um, collecting information and bringing it together as a group in a Google spreadsheet, things of that nature. Um, the students themselves are very respectful of each other's space, but they still seem to make it happen in the classroom. So um, masks and distancing really hasn't become a hindrance to them. It's just a new way of doing things in the classroom. So that's been helpful. And I think technology, honestly, has pay, played a big role in making some of these things possible. Mm-hmm. Some of the things I've seen in Wallingford are, you know, we did have to reduce some of our labs. So I found a lot of teachers switching to do demos of labs that they used to have students do or using the wash your hands, touch the materials, wash your hands again protocol, so that students really could get hands on when they needed to. Um, using online simulations, um, we purchased some, some you know we found for free, but really just trying to get the kids, if they couldn't be hands on, a way to get them to be minds on when it comes to science. That's all, so you're saying like teachers would do the demonstrations like over the Zoom and or just standing in the front of the class and doing the demonstration and either putting their document camera on it so they could see it big up on the screen or with their VDL students just doing it on, on their Google Classrooms. Nice. Have, have um, teachers been able to provide like simple types of like activities kids can do at home or parents can help with so kids can try simple experiments? Has there been any like success doing that kind of stuff? Um, So what I did was like in our elementaries is um, I came up with alternate experiences for our distance learning students that were much more family oriented, family engaged. I added a lot more field investigations that families can do at home to help engage them with the science. So those have been successful on student engagement was I think is still our um, one of our biggest issues that we're struggling with. And Uh so all of these different tools are ways to help increase our student engagement. That's awesome. Karen, you're kind of our, our math specific person here. So at Clemente, 
you know, how does that look? You know, what's the math challenge? And like, how have you been able to get teachers to really engage kids with math virtually and make that make that fun and, ha and exciting? Well, considering um, I, one of the great things that I would say that New Haven has done was promoting um, virtual manipulatives um, to the point where um, um, my supervisor, Ken Matthews, is constantly sharing um, videos of best practices of things that teachers have done to give other teachers ideas of something that they didn't think about. And us as coaches also using the same um, platforms too that we didn't think about. So like what right now, one of my favorites um, to use is Jamboard mm -hmm. and something so simple. And you're like, would I have ever looked at it prior to COVID, this pandemic? Probably not. But now <laughs> I, we, that right there leads into such a discussion about, oh my goodness, this is what I did with Jamboard for math. I just had a teacher today um, was sharing her screen and showing me how she did factors with her, with her fourth grade students and, and how they're interacting with it. And it's, they're having fun. And so the fact that they are, um, it's something that simple and it allows for them also to collaborate. Um, just like I was just um, talking to another teacher earlier, maybe a couple of weeks ago about Google Keep and just being able to collaborate with Keep and then move it over to a Google Doc, just simple things again, like you just really didn't think about. And so I, what, it, it's a good thing and also a bad thing, right? So. Um, I look at, I, as you were introducing Kate and said that she's been in um, Walling for 27 years, correct, Kate? Yeah. Yes. And so I, I think about her and I go, she, everyone just got on the same even playing field when the pandemic happened. It was like everyone became a first year teacher again. Mm -hmm. So now it's like you're within yourself, you're questioning are, am I reaching the students? Am I, am I doing it? Are the kids excited? Are they engaged? Like, and then you're like, oh my goodness, all of these different types of the ways that they're learning, yeah. it's, it's, it's different. So there's some great things about being remote and being virtual, but then there's not so many great things about being remote and being virtual. But one of the things I think that really has stood out is it is allowed for every student to have a voice. And mm -hmm. so, you know, you have those students when they're in front of you that would stay quiet because they were scared to talk, but now virtually allows them to be able to type in something in chat or teachers are using Pear Deck to get um, physical um, responses at the moment that they're teaching um, about how a student is feeling and how they can get answers correct. and um, when teachers are using these things to engage their students, they're taking that material and now they're able to create small groups through Google Meet breakout rooms. And you, all of these things that you probably would have never thought about prior. And so it's, it's a lot to learn all at one time, yeah. it's very overwhelming, but it's a great thing for us as teachers. And I also would think it's a great thing for the students because now we're able to to hit all the different levels in which they learn, so. Yeah, I, I like that you brought up Jamboard and Google Keep and Pear Deck. And I wanted to ask, throw this back to Sue and Barb and Kate, um, what are some of the resources that you guys have seen work asynchronously? Because obviously a lot of student time is asynchronous, right? There's this, all this like time that could almost be thought of as a black hole. Um, let's just face it, especially with parents working, like I'm you know, home working, um, all day long when I've got my kids and I can't check in on them all the time. It's just no way I can ask my nine-year-old every 30 minutes what he's supposed to be doing or if he's supposed to be in English or in gym class, running around like an elephant upstairs, right? <laughs> so what are some of the programs you guys have used that are asynchronous that, you know, you've heard good things from the kids are doing even when they're not in front of teachers? Sue, oh, how about Sue and Barb, you first. 
Well, I mean, I certainly think uh, Legends of Learning would be on that list, right? <laughs> um, so any, that gaming, anything with that gaming aspect tends to be uh -huh. particularly popular with students. So um, at our K-5 level, we're using things like Imagine Learning and ST Math. Um, and uh, in middle school, uh, Legends of Learning has been a real uh, support in our science department. Um, we're also using some gizmo um, simulations. And then we were fortunate to have many digital content partners in terms of even providing, um, you know, textbook access to students who are learning in, in the virtual world. So that's even being able to access those material materials um, on a web-based platform was really, really helpful. And then, you know, some of the programs that are more adaptive, something like an Alex um, that really meets students where they are um, and then customizes instruction has been very helpful. Awesome. Good. Very, very good to hear the games are going well. I think that's, you know, kids love games. They're, they're playing them no matter what. So. They're engaging, they're an easy sell, they're easy to use for teachers. Um, and if the teacher's not battling with the student about, you know, doing their minutes or getting their time in, that's going to be a win-win for both the teacher and the student and the parent who can't check in on the student every couple of minutes. Yeah, exactly. Kate, what do you, what, do you, what is, what kind of tools are you, uh, you cooking up over there? There have been like so, so many tools that we've tried and used and, you know, each one has its own purpose. One of the um, things that we purchased district-wide were Wacom tablets so that when teachers are doing math and science that they can be writing, you know, an equation that you can't really do with a touchpad um, so that it really helped with instruction for students. Um, Cami has been super helpful. I think a lot of the things like Google Rewrite we were using as adaptive technology tools but in this environment, they've become tools for everyone. So in that way, we sort of leveled the playing field with students because these tools that were just specific to a certain group of students are now helpful for all students, whatever their, their environment is. We've used Gizmos, Kessler Science, Legends has been, has been great for us. Um, we use Discovery Education. And those tools are great because we can track what students are doing. Right. Students have accountability. We can get feedback. So those are the best tools is the ones where, where you can get that feedback for students. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, and kind of on that same point here, um, you know, like, so you guys have mentioned all these tools, kind of strategies. Okay, so now think about how far we've come. Uh, let's just be honest for a second with everyone who's here. What has not worked and what are you gonna keep? What's the stuff that you're like, forget it. I am not doing that again because that was a failure. And here's the stuff that I am going to keep doing because no matter whether we're virtual or we're in person, this is going to work in either environment. So how about we start with Karen? So I'm, think, I, I'm thinking about that question. And um, <clears throat> I would say that one of the great things I think that New Haven has done was provided um, a plethora of different resources for the teachers to use. And while it is very overwhelming when you look at all of what has been provided to you, I think that um, if you were to take what works for your students that you're teaching, I think then that would, um, it, it works. So I know like for in my particular building, we right now have been, um, I had to write it down, so that's why I'm looking down, I'm sorry, because <laughs> we have a lot. So like we use the Cami extension, um, we use Jamboard, like I stated, we use Pear Deck. And so um, if really quickly, if I mention Pear Deck, while that is great for say a fifth grade and up, it may not be so great for say a kindergarten student, right? Uh -huh. So Jamboard can be can work for the kindergarten student because they can write on their screen and play around with it. So um, I think if when what I try to do, like even when I'm when I'm trying to promote, say, Jamboard or even Legends of Learning, showing um, the teachers how they can use it with the different um, technology that the students have, because in our school, our K through two, some second graders have iPads. Some of the second graders, depending on um, if they kept their um, devices from last year, have Chromebooks. And so now you have to cons worry about what type of Chromebook they have yeah. and how many things they have open and so forth. So um, I think 
like I said, it all, it just all depends on what you're using that which that you think would work for your students and teachers know their students the best. And so with that, you can then determine what works and what doesn't work. Um, but I, I right thus far, we've gotten a, a chance to, to test out Legends of Learning and the kids like playing games, they do. And we also have an opportunity to try Freckle. And I know for me, when as being a math coach, I'm always trying to find things that our students in the K through eight, because that's the building that I that um, I service, can use. Right. Um, and that could work for all the different grades because if, for example, we start teaching the kids from kindergarten how to use Legends of Learning, and we stay with Legends of Learning, by the time they reach third and fourth grade, it becomes second, second nature. They know how to use it. They become familiar with it. And so yeah. then they can really start to hone in on their independent, the indep being independent. Yeah. And that's, that's the goal, right? And so, um, but we use a lot, we use gizmos, we use desmos, we, um, some schools use reflex, some schools use Dreambox. I think it, we try to make it um, a little bit more um, catered to the building and what your building needs. Um, yeah. for my building, I chose Freckle because, um, and we chose Legends of Learning too, but, um, because we've tried different things and like for my building IXL doesn't work because the teachers need to be able to assign what it is without the kids being able to see other things because they get distracted right. so one of the benefits is that you can create your own playlist like legends of learning allows you to do right. allows you to create your own playlist in a sense too so that what that's one of the things that I think has been really great is that we can create your own playlist so you can be more about individualized learning for our I students. Like what, yeah, I like what you're saying about the individualized instruction and teacher choice. Kate, what do you, what do you think? Any, any like cautionary tales and then stories of success kind of what, what hasn't worked and... Well, in, in the spring, you know, yeah. we launched very, very quickly um, using what we had and then we had to make some major shifts over the summer. One of the big changes we made, because we were a Google Classroom district, grades three through 12. Um, and so we just expanded it in the spring. Okay, now we're Google Classroom K-12. And right. our, our K-2 families really struggled with using Google Classroom. Our K-2 students ha hadn't really logged in. Like they, we didn't have them use any of the Google apps. So it really was a very difficult transition. But mm -hmm. we had had quite a few teachers using Seesaw individually in their classrooms. So we made the decision as a district that in K-2, we were going to use Seesaw for those students because it's much more parent accessible. Mm -hmm. yep. It's much easier for students to post videos and writing and drawing and content. And so that was one of the lessons that we learned was that Google Classroom wasn't the best tool for every single age of student. Another thing that we, we do is we always have um, like science journals and writing journals and and math pages and we sent a lot of that stuff home and, it, and in the spring you know kids didn't know how to take a picture and share something they didn't know how to post something so we really had to make that adjustment over the summer and do a lot of professional development with our teachers to learn how to create things digitally yeah. so they weren't forcing kids into doing something that they couldn't be successful with so we really had to meet the families where they were um, you know, we have a great range of families with their technology, their technology understanding. We had to do the same with providing hotspots for people who just, they didn't have internet at home. It just wasn't, they might have had a phone, but they, they didn't really have internet at home. And, um, yeah. but I, I think we've, we've really grown a lot since where we were in the spring and, you know, we continue to learn. Like there are things we want to change. We change every trimester. We're like, oh, that didn't work. Let's try this. And mm -hmm. it's constantly like a cycle of being flexible, learning, and revision, which is which is really at the heart of what education is. It's just to a degree that we've never done it before. Mm -hmm. I like what you, what you said about the, you know, the taking the pictures of the, of the work, because I was doing that with my seven-year-old. And I was thinking while I was doing it, but he's got an HP, you know, device in front of him. Why do I have to take these pictures? 
And the district, same thing, you know, clearly did work over the summer to make it more digitally interactive. And I was thinking the same thing, like, you know, I'm at work right now and all my stuff is about deliverables. And I think we're actually even teaching little kids now what the real world is like, because everybody deals with the device now, right? This is, this is a part of a story about everyone's life. And how do you deal with deliverables and getting your assignments done, even though you might not, let's just face it, be paying attention every minute of every class, whether you're sitting in front of a teacher or you're sitting on your couch. And so I think that's really interesting, like you're saying, you know, there's just has to be this flexibility of thought around the way that we deliver information and we can't be fixed into like, like this. Plus it's so funny and ironic to be taking pictures of workbooks when you're doing virtual learning. <laughs> right, so this is this adjustment. Um, Susan and Barbara, what do you think? What, what, what just did not work and what have you um, had to change and, and you know, make better? So I would say one of the things that we found challenging in the spring was the lack of a specific structure for a student or specific meeting time. And we really learned that too much asynchronous learning was not good because it, mm -hmm. and even as a society, we didn't have a structure we were following. You mentioned earlier that Tuesday was the same as Saturday. Yeah. Um, so we've moved to a greater structure um, starting the school year off this year. But I think one of the things that we've learned is that we um, we're better able to leverage the technology across the board, regardless of the program. So it's not only in the academic services that we're providing our students and instruction, but it's also looking at um, our meetings that are happening across district. There are ways now that we are more collaborative because people are very comfortable with jumping on Google Meets or a Zoom. So let's jump on, let's collaborate, let's talk. So that's really helped staff um, and administrators throughout the district. We just did parent-teacher conferences virtually. We've had greater participation than we have any year in the past. But again, leveraging that technology, it's convenient. They can use it from their, uh, do it from their phone. Things like registration, um, forms that we once would send home in paper to fill out, those have all changed. So it's really pushed all of us in a new direction. Um, to, to make changes that are going to last over time that really have made us more efficient. That's great. And I would say, you know, I think Karen alluded to it a little bit that there are so many tools out there. And um, when the shutdown first hit, I, I must have gotten easily 20 emails a day from different vendors saying hey we're here to help use this hey we're here to help use this and so i think we really needed to to work with our teachers to say um it's not about how many tools you're using it's about using those select tools really well um yeah. to help you improve student learning you don't you know let's not throw everything against the wall and see what sticks let's you know pick the things that are going to work best for you and your students and, and focus on those. Um, and, and I also think that, um, you know, we found that there are some students and teachers who have really thrived in this online environment. And so I think that that's one of the, those uh, lasting effects, things that will hopefully keep with us to um, provide avenues for the, the students who did well um, in an online environment to be able to continue learning that way, uh, even once all of this, you know, COVID restrictions go away. That's kind of something I wanted to expand on too, is, is that idea of like, if we're thinking about, like, so blended learning is going nowhere, right? That was the first thing that occurred to me, not just as some, as a, you know, as a co-founder of Legends, but as a former teacher, like we've changed education forever. It doesn't matter if we, have, if we had a vaccine tomorrow, everyone's like, virtually everyone's got one-to-one -one technology or one-to-two or going in that direction. And with blended learning, virtual learning is here to stay on some level. So my question to you, I'll just keep it with you and uh, Sue and Barb here for a second. What are, how do you see science and math being taught differently now going forward? So you think about the 2020, the 21, 22 school year even, you know, what are some best practices that are gonna stay regardless of your kids come back that are more blended in nature that you can see being really effective for kids? Well, I think one of the things is that because both our teachers and our students are so much more comfortable with using the technology, it's really opened up access to, um, you know, places and people 
that they would never have had access to just sitting in their classroom, right? I mean, they can talk to astronauts, they can, you know, go under the ocean. They, they, there's just all sorts of scientific exploration um, and real world math applications that can be studied and shared through a virtual environment. Um, you know, and then you take that a step for, forward with some of the simulations that are available and even some of the gaming platforms are available. You know, I'm, I'm never going to be able to uh, allow my students to experiment with radioactive material, but in a simulation I can <laughs> and they can see what happens. So I, I think there's things like that that are really going to be game changers in, in STEM areas. Um, that, and I think people's comfort level with doing things like that has increased. So that's been a real positive. That's a really interesting think, idea, like playing with Chernobyl, right? Or like yeah. <laughs> that scene, right? Nuclear explosion and right. Having all the interesting experience, but not the, not the actual physical impact. Right. Yeah, Barb, sorry, go ahead. No, it's all right. And I think our teachers have become more educated about what they want from a product now. Um, it's no longer just the bells and whistles and what's flashy, but they now are using products over a period of time to really support their instruction. So they've been, uh, become better consumers of digital content. And even with the request that Sue has received recently, um, their teachers are looking for things that are filling the gap. And again, using, leveraging the technology to meet a need that we can't meet either in person or virtually. But it, it's interesting to see how the requests are changing as well. I can totally see that. And I think that we're also having that experience of teachers are, teachers are better consumers and users of the technology because they see it as a, like you said, a sustained tool, not just like a throwaway. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to do this on Friday because I forgot my lesson plan, right? Or my, we have an assembly. It's mm -hmm. like, it's going to be a regular part of my instruction. It's really mm -hmm. a change in thought. Um, Kate or Karen, what do you guys, what do you guys think about um, sustainable blended learning practices? Um, so one of the things that I thought about was the real world experience, right? So we always um, may have spoken about when you're teaching math, how this relates to the real world, but like Susan and Barb said, now you can actually show it. Now you can have them go and look at it and go, oh, wow, this is why I'm learning this? Exactly. This is one of the reasons. Um, I think it also allows for a little bit more um, student collaboration. Um, one of the funniest things that I saw the other day in a class was um, the teacher was um, showing the students how to do something in particular. And one of the students was like, sir, all you have to do is do this. Mm -hmm. And they showed them how to do, and, and that we would have never gotten the opportunity to see that if we weren't in the environment that we're in. So I am so excited to see mm -hmm. and moving forward how much the kids are going to still be engaged. They're going to still have choice. They're, um, we're able to do so many things cross curriculum um, that you didn't realize how so many things um, were related. You know, we always say that math and science are sisters, but now you get to really see how math and science are sisters and how language arts and social studies are cousins to yeah. everyone how everything ties in we're all related and so that to me is one of the biggest i think takeaways is that now more and more than ever everyone can't be in their little bubble anymore of yeah. i teach math i teach science i teach you know now we have to pretty much essentially be like an elementary teach a elementary school teacher we have to be able to adjust and bring everything back to what it is that we want our students to learn chunk what you instead of it being the big picture you know the less is more type of mentality where less was less is actually now more because it requires you to do so much planning that you want them to truly grasp what it is that you're teaching so now you can pull these different resources to mm -hmm. put emphasis on it and so i would, Great point. I would say that to me like that's a key point I like the virtual the virtual field trips. The idea of students showing teachers. Kate, are you you? Uh, what do you think about all this stuff? I mean, you really have the virtual mission to Mars, and you know, like 
how are, what do you see as the sustainable stuff going on in Wallingford? Give your, your last word here before you have for Q&A to the, to the audience. Well, everything that everyone else has said, but in addition, one of the big shifts that I saw from the spring even to the fall was the level of engagement of families in the education. It's become so much more transparent to them. They don't have to ask their child what happened at school today because everything is accessible and visible to them. They really became true partners across the board in what, what their children were learning. And those increased communication pathways and that change of role is something I really hope that we can hold on to post COVID mm -hmm. because I think it can have really powerful impact on, on student learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It's um, so student driven learning is something that we've been talking about for years. Uh, I know that when we do trainings, demonstrations for teachers before COVID, it was more ethereal. Like people would be like, yeah, that sounds great. Student driven learning. I'd love to see that. And now we have been kind of like hardcore, like like one to one, like, you know, hardware. We, we have no choice. It is student driven learning. And if the kids aren't doing it, they're not learning. So it's really fascinating to me how we have created this. And I love this idea of like the STEM field trips that you guys are talking about or like you know, Barb and sister, like, we're going to go deal with radioactive chemicals in an online lab. And, you know, we're going to have experiences like you can go to Paris on Google Maps, right? Like you can do these things. You could design a new Eiffel Tower, right, Karen? Or you could design a Coliseum using your math skill sets. So I think there's just like a world of possibilities. And our teachers now have skill sets with, with technology because they had no choice. Let's face it, some of them, right? And we brought some of those people along and now they're ready um, to do those things in a way they weren't. So that's been very exciting. Um, we're going to open it up for questions now, Lindsay. Um, if, it, if you have some, if you want to open it up for Q and A, uh, and we'll see what we got from our from our uh, our audience here. Awesome. So if anyone would like to ask a question, please use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. Um, I do see that we already have one, so we'll get started with that. Um, and it is, how do you ensure science learning continues in K-5, which can be hard to do even in the best of times? Well, I, I can tell you that in Meriden, you know, you have to um, make sure that you're scheduling time for science learning um, as much as we'd like to say it's, it's uh, part of all areas um, if we don't set aside some specific time for that science investigation um, it's not going to happen and then I also think that it's very important to make sure that we're utilizing the environment that our schools are in to also further that that science learning so uh, many of our classrooms um, or many of our schools we have outdoor classrooms and nature trails um, but even if you don't have a formal nature trail or outdoor classroom, you know, weather permitting, get the kids outside and explore the world around you and help them make those connections to science and how it impacts their daily lives. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely also kind of add to that and say when you're creating your activity, um, whatever it may be, you know have the students predict different things and just in general they they'll realize that something as simple as the weather would be and plants and the cycle of a, things like that are things that are just like outside that they probably never thought of you can make it into a lesson and i think in addition to just having the time it's also pushing into other subjects by having more interdisciplinary instruction when it comes to science, you know, in your, in your reading and writing units to have science as the content for your nonfiction reading is a way to push in when you're doing math, say, analyzing data of using what you've done in science to analyze the data about it. So it doesn't just become a discrete subject that you do from X minutes to X minutes, but it, it sort of embeds itself within the other content areas. Absolutely. So the next question we have is about group-based activities. Um, how during this time have you been able to integrate group-based or collaborative 
um, activities in STEM for your students. I think for us in Wallingford, one of the things that's really helped us is the launch of Google breakout rooms and for Google Enterprise has really helped us be able to have students in small groups. Um, but one of the things we use legends of learning for that too. So if I have students, you know, in a science lesson and I need to meet with a small group of students, which is much harder when you're when you're digital. Um, that I can have those groups of students working on playlists that I've already set up in Legends and then meet with those small groups. So, you know, using tools like that have, have really helped us have those group, group activities. Um, and as I said before, like when we're doing hands-on activities, we have students partner, one's watching and keeping the data, the other's using the materials. We do wash, touch, wash, you know, those are ways that we've really still been able to have like our, our group labs in science is by defining the roles and using um, the cleaning protocols as well. Or designating a scientist of the day on a rotational basis. So today we're looking at this and, you know, Sue is going to come up and be our scientist of the day and be uh -huh. the person who touches the manipulatives and, and does that type of thing. And then the next day it's a different student and they, you know, that's great. That was the experience that way. Well, we're still virtual. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that's going to be something that is uh, going to be interesting <laughs> when we return back. But I think what, um, like what I know, um, what our science teachers have really been doing again is showing them like letting them visually see things. I know one of the things that one of the teachers has done is done demonstrations in the science lab and show them what happens when this happens and so forth. And they're able to write about it. Um, again, using Jamboard, it, you can assign each frame to a group of students and they go to their frame and they collaboratively work together about the questions that are discussion questions that are being asked of them, which it all which works very differently than what it would happen if they were in the classroom right the noise and they start to interrupt each other but it's been very interesting as well as um learning about the google meet breakout room so that they can start participating and doing those kind of things as well I'll, I'll give a shout out to another resource too that we actually used it for enrichment purposes um Typically, we offer STEM camps over the summer, and we did not do in-person camps this year. We did virtual camps, but through the National Inventors Hall of Fame camp invention, they actually ship a box of materials to each student's home. And then the teachers during the virtual week of camp um, had a morning session, helped the students unpack the boxes, talked about what the daily activity was, Students went out on their own, recorded observations using Jamboard, and then came back together at the end of the day um, to share their creations um, and provide feedback to one another. So that was a really great resource for providing some hands-on um, experimentation. Well, this, this has been a, a fantastic panel. I want to thank you guys all for being here today. I think like, your, your comments just at the end here, honestly, about like, Science seems to be interdisciplinary. I mean, it's it kind of that kind of just hits the nail on the head with the whole the whole STEM theme. I'm really hopeful um, as a former teacher and as working with educators all the time that all educators start to see education as more cross curricular, and that this is like the real opportunity. It's just you know, is to say like there's no reason to silo science from math or language arts from social studies. Don't get me started about that. Mm -hmm. And you know, if I used to teach social studies, you know. <laughs> Um, you'd like this with the language arts teachers, like, come on, get it in there, come on. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's really valuable, I think, um, to have your guys' perspectives on how do we do this going forward? How do we have blended learning work in the STEM environment? Um, and like, what are some of the ways? And I think you guys provided a lot of solutions for teachers, you know, ways to think about resources and implementation and, and how all that's going to work, whether we are fully vaccinated back in the classroom or we're doing some combination in the coming year. So. Thank you guys all for being here. Thank, every, thank you to everybody who came and attended. Um, and we will follow up with you guys with some resources. And I hope you guys have a fabulous rest of your week. You too. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for having us. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.